All right, everyone, welcome back. So, I don't know what day it is anymore. Uh, today is the snow apocalypse, by the way. So I have to film these a little ahead of time, as I mentioned to you, so I can add all the effects. So I'm a little out of it having trudged through uh, about two feet of snow. Regardless, I do recall something about what we talked about last time, which was we finished up a discussion of the harmonic oscillator. So uh, we got to the routine of, uh, of introducing a model problem, looking up the answer from an 18th century textbook, uh, the wave functions, right, those are the solutions. Then we learn other things like the energies. Then we covered some other phenomenon like, um, let's see, what, what did we cover? Uh, we covered turning points, and we covered how, how that's like a tunneling phenomenon, and even examples of how it matters in chemistry, especially for chemical reactions, and things like isotope effects. And we use isotope effects to figure out mechanisms, and when we figure out mechanisms, we can manipulate things to make them work better. So that sounds kind of important, right? Okay, at the end of the lecture, then we got into some multidimensional stuff. Now, I didn't really get a chance to cover it, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, in Leo of a review, I'm just gonna start there. Okay, for multidimensional, um, you know, this whole free wave particle in a box thing, and everything was an X, uh, you know, everything was just X something, right? Sine X, everything was sine X. I guess we had E to the I X. That's fine, but we live in three dimensions, so this is ultimately just can't be right. Except for the bond deal. Now, the bond, that works as one dimensional because any two atoms, no matter how they're oriented, we can always draw a one dimensional vector that connects the two. So that works, but that's really about it in terms of being like truly one dimensional. Let's march in little steps towards three dimensional. We'll do two dimensional first because why wouldn't we, right? There's not much to it. Now I'm gonna save some of this for your homework. But the way to deal with this properly is, 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 is almost always the case. The kinetic energy operator is always the part that makes all this difficult. So that's where we have to start introducing more than one dimension. Obviously, I've just simply added minus h bar squared over 2m, double derivative with y. Of course, I just factored the minus h bar squared over 2m. If I wanted to add three dimensions, I would just do the same for z. Okay, so at this point, that's really all there is to it. Now, this truly is easy, okay, where it's going to get difficult, um, actually, in this class, is that these x, y, z forms for multidimensional don't describe really anything relevant. Things that are relevant is what, well, like atoms. We are now marching our way towards describing atoms. That is our purpose. It's going to take several more lectures. Because X, Y, and Z describe boxes, but atoms are round. So hopefully you know what I'm getting at. We're going to have to start working in X, Y, and Z in three dimensions, but not with X, Y, Z, but R, theta, C. We have to do this in spherical coordinates. So we're going to do some basic things with X, Y, and Z in multidimensional. It'll only take 10 minutes, and then we're going to start working towards spherical coordinates. So that's the idea. Okay, but for now, for the next 10 minutes, this will be truly easy. So uh, one reason that you, uh, you add these together is because we know that this is kinetic energy and energy adds. Now think about uh, the equal partition theorem, that thing I bring up all the time. And I do that because I can trace a lot of the phenomena that we cover. Usually I can find a way to relate it to energy and therefore the equal partition theorem. And you had the equal partition theorem last semester. That's one of the reasons I keep bringing it up. Uh, so it's just useful. In this case, it's very useful because what you learn about the equal partition theorem is that, and, and don't even worry about writing this down, internal energy is one half kT, you probably had RT, because there's B, times degrees of freedom, right? Now that was three for an atom like argon that can translate to x, y, and z, three translations, those are three degrees of freedom, and that's why three has kdt is the energy, is the internal energy of something like argon. If it can vibrate, uh, rotate, then that requires more than one atom, then you get more degrees of freedom, but there you go. Okay, so the reason again I'm tracing this up is that you, you add degrees of freedom. 
And you see me literally doing that here. And in fact, I can use this description to derive the equal partition theorem. I don't think I'm going to do that this year. Sometimes I do that, but not this year. Okay, so that's why they add. And there's a couple of ways to think about the, the next thing. So, so there's not much to this, but then the wave functions. The wave functions end up being multiplied. And we'll, we'll do a little bit of a proof today, but something tells me that if we were like math majors, and this is our Diffie cube, our solution, like, like we have some like crazy math way of, of showing that the solution has to look that way. I, I don't even know that, and if there is a way to do that, I'm not sure. What I'm going to show you is that, um, let's see, I think actually you do this on the homework. There's multiple ways to show you that the wave function has to look like this. And one of the things I'm going to have you do on a homework, and, and don't write this down, all right, so, so no, no, uh, a wave function, if you add them, you know, if this is like e to the i k x and that's e to the i k y, you don't add them. On your homework, what I'm going to have you do is take this and put it in here, and you're going to see that you get nonsense for results. Uh, there's another way to do it, and I'm going to do that today. So there's multiple ways, multiple ways to show that that is not correct. So another thing you can do, and I, and I think I'm still repeating myself from last time, no, is that something like this. So we, we know that sine kx is like a solution to basically everything, right? Well, uh, you can't do this, sine kx times y. No, no, that, because that is not this. This is not that. This would be, this is psi x comma y, not psi x times psi y. Again, that's, you know, it's some details on mathematical notation, but mathematics is exact, you know, it, it writes out exactly what it means, and this, this is not that, so no. Hopefully you didn't write that down. Okay. All right, now, I can prove a little, I'm going to do a little bit more with this. In this, you need to write this, yeah, you, you always need to write this down. I'm a little afraid, I just graded your first exams, and I'm a little afraid you're not writing things down, but, but anyway, that's, that's on you. You don't need to write things down. This one is important. What I'm about to do, I'm going to have you do on the second exam, probably the final exam. It'll be on homeworks. You've actually seen this before. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this to that in a very specialized way. It's an algorithm. It's actually, you actually saw this when we did commutator. So I'm doing the same thing again. Now, one thing you should realize, and hopefully you figured this out from the last test, is that when I do something over and over again in lectures, you will see it on homeworks and exams, right? Okay, now, with this information, so what? All right, now here's how we do this. And blah, 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 blah. what I'm gonna do is, all right, we'll, we'll work with no potential energy, so this is like a multi-dimensional free wave. What I'm going to do is I am going to do the eigenvalue equation. So, and, and let me use some specialized language. I'm acting on the right. So, here's the operator that acts on things, and the wave function is always to the right of that, because that's how we do calculus expressions, right? Uh, we, we read it from right to left, opposite of the way we read books, right? Isn't that kind of weird? Anyway, okay, so I'm going to do that. Uh, actually, let me cut, you, you know what, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try something different. Let me show you what the next step is before I do step one. What I'm going to do is this. I act on the right, and then I divide by the left. Okay, now notice that energy is like 5 EV. So if I take 1 over sine times 5 times sine, you just end up with the number, right? So, so you see that because energy is just a number, if I act on the right and divide on the left, then you're just left with that number. So this is step one and this is step two. Now the reason I have to do this in steps is, now you see the algorithm, let me actually do it. All right, now let me make sure I'm reading my own notes. Okay, tell you what. Um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this kind of funkily. Leave, leave a little room, okay? Uh, we'll see why in a second. Okay, here's the x. Okay, so I'm using this form: psi of x times psi of y. 
Alright, you notice I haven't written psi of y yet. Psi x, psi y. Well, here's the thing. Derivatives are like walls, right? You can't go past through them. Whatever psi of y is, let's say it's sine ky. A derivative with respect to x doesn't do anything to it. It remains psi of ky. Now, if whatever x is, whatever psi of x is, you, you have to think about what this does. Uh, because, I mean, you know why. I mean, because it changes it. Okay, my point here is that I can... I almost forgot that negative sign, right? The point is, is that I can take the psi of y and pass it through this first part of the kinetic energy. And likewise, I now do the same thing with the y. Of course, x passes through that. Right, not much to it. Actually, really awkward to write this way. Anyway, okay. So that's step one. Okay, step up, oh, and that's equal to. I don't want to skip anything. It's easy to forget that part because it doesn't really do anything. Okay, now I divide by psi x, psi y on the left. Let me make sure I'm not blowing that. All right, so what you end up with is uh, minus psi y over, over psi x, psi y. So that ends up being minus 1 over psi of x. R squared over 2m. Again, I always refer to derivatives like smart operators, active operators, operators that do things. And then uh, it's a little plus minus 1 over. I'm just trying to be uh, self similar in how I write this. Okay, so same deal. Maybe I should speed up time, right? This is kind of boring. And as I said before, this will just be equal to energy. So again, I've divided out by everything. Okay, well now, so what about this? Okay, now, you've actually seen this before, something similar. I, I mentioned this when we were doing Planck distribution. So remember, that was the first time, I'm assuming the first time, for most of you at least, that you had seen a differential equation. Especially a differential equation with like a bunch of x's and y's and z's in it. Okay, here we just have uh, x's and y's. Now, if you recall at the time, I pointed out that what I was trying to do when we were doing Planck, and I've done the exact same thing here, is that I've got a little differential thing with x's in it. h bar squared of 2 of that, whatever. That's, those, those are constants, right? They don't really matter. Don't forget it. <laughs> Uh, so, so this has x's and this has y's in it, right? All y's. And it's this plus that. Okay, when that happens, and I hope you remember this, each, each little sub q, each little miniature Schrodinger equation is itself equal to a constant. Now the reason is, is that if, you know, this plus that is equal to a constant, the easy way to make this plus that equal to a constant is to have each term itself a constant. You know, a plus b is equal to 1. Um, you know, that helps if like a is 0 and b is 1, right? It, it just makes sense. Now think about this. Sine plus cosine is equal to 1. Um, yeah, I mean, that depends on, on how those two functions interact with each other. In other words, they have to like cancel each other out perfectly. But why would they, right? So why would uh, something happening in the x direction, why would the y direction like respond to that? So if I take the particle and I bend its path in x, then there would have to be something happening in y that basically cancels that out such that a constant is maintained. Now, that doesn't make sense. Now, you know from basic physics that what you, what, you know, when you perturb something in one dimension, let's say you change its velocity, you assume that the, the velocity component in any other dimension remains, remains unchanged, right? So again, that's basic physics mechanics. So that means that changes in one direction should not affect 
that change it, change because I have a double derivative, should not affect or, or, or you know, the, uh, another dimension does not respond to that. So given that information, that these dimensions are blind to each other, the only way that two functions can add to a constant is if they're not functions at all. They, they themselves are equal to constants. Okay, so now if that doesn't resonate, just, you just want to roll with it. <laughs> okay, I hope that makes sense. That's the best I can do. But even if it doesn't make sense, just roll with the formula. Okay. Now, the implications of this plus that being a constant. Now, that constant happens to you know, sum up to energy. That means that there has to be an energy portion for each dimension. Now, hopefully that also makes more sense, right? That's kind of like the equal partition theorem. So from this, what I learned is that, um, sorry, I'm not using the board well, energy must be decomposable into portions that belong, one portion that belongs to x and one portion that belongs to y. So what I can do then is I can solve each one as though it's a miniature Schrodinger equation where this x field isn't equal to e, it's just equal to the e sub x. It's, it's, it's portion and the same for y. And now I've got two miniature Schrodinger equations. Those are usually going to be easier to solve. Either maybe I happen to know the answer already, or I go look at my 18th century mathematical textbook for those simpler, smaller equations, and of course I'll find the answer. We have the answer for everything right now, right? And, and there you go. All right, in this case, I'll write it down. Um, tell you what, tell you what, I'll do, I'll do x, and then you can just assume the same for y, right? Because it's just a letter. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down I'm writing it a little differently. I just have to compact it a little bit. There we go. Okay, so again, this is this is this part. And what I mean by it's equal to its own portion of energy, that's what I mean. Right. Now remember, energy is a number, it's like 5 eV. Or maybe it's a total 5 eV. 5 eV, then this is 2.5 eV, and the other 2.5 eV goes to y. Okay, now what I can do with this is I can multiply everything by psi of x. I'm just doing some algebra. And look at this. This is our free wave equation. Now, I, again, what I want to point out here is that the reason that it turned into a free wave equation, the, the thing that we did, we, we literally did this on the first day of quantum mechanics, it's just that instead of e, I've got e sub x. That's the only difference, and that doesn't do anything. The reason that I derived this into a free wave equation is because I was doing a multi-dimensional free wave problem. I never had potential. This will be more difficult if I have potential energy, but let's not worry about that right now. Okay. So the solution to this would be sine, cosine, kx, e to the i kx, e to the minus i kx, yada yada yada. Now, how, how would I know what's what? Well, just like when we did free wave, I have to tell you, uh, this is a free wave problem. And, and by the way, the great turkey that created this two-dimensional universe threw this electron forward. Therefore, the correct solution, you know, forward and x, Therefore, the correct solution is e to the i kx, right? I have to give you more information. Here's another example. How does e sub x and e sub y, how do they partition? Let's say that the total energy is 5 eV. Uh, oh, well, that's 2.5, that's 2.5 eV. Each part, each part gets a, a share. You know, that sounds reasonable. But I don't know that it has to be. We have to ask the turkey that created the universe, this two-dimensional universe. You see, I think it would depend on the nature of the problem. I could imagine that uh, a, a universe is created such that that's not true. The way you would know that is you, you'd have to be told, right? So that's one of the things that's kind of unsatisfying about quantum mechanics is to solve quantum mechanics, you often, you have to have so much information that like, I don't know what else there is to, to ask, <laughs> you know? <laughs> to, to solve this, I, have, I already have to tell you everything about it. I have to tell you the energy, so why, why am I even trying to calculate them? I already know them. I have to admit, that's actually true. I'm not trying to be clever here and show you why that's not true. 
That's true. That's one of the reasons I, I usually don't like teaching quantum mechanics. I usually teach thermo because I like that a little bit better. You don't run into those problems. Uh, okay, so again, uh, um, this, is, this is our miniature Schrodinger equation. And of course, likewise, let me just, let me just write it down for completeness because otherwise it, the world will blow up or something. Uh, y is the same, but y would, y would y be any different than x? Of course it's not. And its solution, given that I've written a free wave deal, its solution is sine or cosine ky. It could be e to the i ky, it could be e to the minus i ky, depending on how it's set up, which you would be told. Now you can also imagine that maybe this is a particle in a two-dimensional box. That could also be true. Uh, because that's also like a weird free wave problem, right? So, in fact, um, I'm going to do that. I'm actually going to do that example. I'll give you an example of a particle in a two-dimensional box. Let me throw. Let me just throw one more thing at you, which is to point out that once you solve what psi of x and psi of y are, and I've, I've given you multiple examples, and you would know this. You would know this based on the initial information and these equations, which you should be able to do this. This was just a bunch of algebra, right? You should be able to do this. Um, what was I talking about? Anyway, so, uh, so you solve for side of x, side of y, what do you do with them? The total wave function is you multiply them together. Sine kx times sine ky. Now, I'll give you one last tidbit. Then we're going to do a particle in a two-dimensional box. Particle in three-dimensional box is obviously just very similar. And then we're going to go on to rotation. Anyway, so let me point out something. This is not the answer to one of your homework questions. It's just related. This is another way to prove what, what you have on one of your homework questions is to show that um, what, I, what I'm doing here is I'm going to show you once again that the total wave function is not psi of x plus psi of y, it is psi of x times psi of y. Again, you're going to do this on your homework. You're going to apply psi of x plus psi of y to the Hamiltonian, and you're going to find some crazy result. I'm going to show you another way to do it, to show that this is this being this. Is not the case. So we know that the absolute value of a wave function is of course the complex conjugate times the wave function. We've done that a zillion times. And again, I want to emphasize this is proof that once you solve those miniature Schrodinger equations that you multiply them, you don't add them. This is proof not to add them. Okay, what you get starts out being sensible. You're going to have the absolute value in the x direction. And you're going to have the absolute value in the y direction. That's because you have complex conjugate times the function, the regular function. And then what you get is nonsense. You get a dimension in x times y and then vice versa. Okay, now again, the problem with this is, this is nonsense. And if you're wondering, like, what is all this jibber-jabber, why is that nonsense of this other stuff not? Because this is a probability density. And I forgot, how, I forgot how to spell probability, by the way. You just saw that, and I can never fix it. Anyway, so this is a probability density. Now, and this means that there's crosstalk. This means that what happens in x affects what happens in y, and vice versa. Now, just like I said when we were talking about this process, which I call the separability process, separating from x and y, and why they're equal to a constant, because there can be no crosstalk, that's happening here, and just like before, it's still nonsense. So that's why when you solve these things, you know, the real, the real solution is psi x times psi y, not psi x plus uh, psi x plus psi y. Again, no 
I'll probably put that on a what's wrong question, and only those of you who are not watching this one, not talking to, not because I don't want to talk to you because you're not listening, only you will get this wrong. So, but hey, I mean, that's, that's, that's on you. Okay, now the next thing I'm going to do is a particle in a two-dimensional box, and that will be it for this XYZ stuff. Um, let me wipe out the board and I'll be right back. Uh, I have some nice computer graphics on that one, so give me one moment. All right, we're back. So, let's apply this towards a particle in a two-dimensional box. All right, now, what that means is, is that I've got an X dimension that goes from 0 to L. However, this time it's going to go from 0 to L sub X. So I'm just going to label that L sub X. Now, we've got to have another dimension, so here's L sub Y. Now, I'm not going to do three dimensions because I can't really graph that, right? Um, how do I, well, we'll see in a moment. Now, the X, sorry, the Z direction, of course, would be, in this case, potential energy. And we know that potential energy for a particle and box situation goes off to infinity. Right, so you see I don't have, I can't represent potential energy and do a three-dimensional particle in the box because that requires four dimensions. And it, it's already awkward I'm doing this on a two-dimensional board, but I'm clever enough to, to render that, but I can't I can't add a L sub Z and potential energy as well, right? That's that's kind of impossible. There we go. Um, and here, let me make it look a little bit more 3D-ish. There we go. That looks, hopefully that looks a little bit better. All right. Okay, so we've now got ourselves a two-dimensional track. And you know what? This is actually like a really good representation for like a drum. And you'll see some, I have some wave functions, some computer wave functions, so it looks kind of cool anyway. All right, now, um, I'm not gonna really, I'm not gonna do any derivations. I'm just gonna write down the answer. I've actually done enough derivations to answer this question. Now, you should be, I hope that this always stands out in your mind. What does it mean to answer the question? It always means you solve the wave functions. Then you plug the wave functions back in and get other information. All right, so the solution to the two-dimensional particle in a box problem would simply be, uh, let me make sure, okay, so that would be the total wave function is, again, two wave functions multiplied. Now I'm gonna give myself a little bit of a space here. Pay attention to that. That means that that's for the normalization. I'm gonna do the normalization in a minute. You know, we usually like to put the normalization up front, so I'm going to wait a minute on that. Okay, what is the one-dimensional particle in a box? Well, it's n, but I'm going to have to give it a little n sub x. That's the quantum number. Looks like I'm going to have two quantum numbers, right? Uh, n pi over l sub x times x. All right, so again, n sub x has, like, the number of nodes. It tells me ground, if n of x is 1, that's like ground state. Any other number, like 2, 3, 4, are excited states. We've covered, we've covered this. It's all the same thing. It's just that now I'm multiplying it by the same deal, except that now I've just got y's instead of x's. Okay, so again, there's really nothing to derive because I mean, we've done this so many times. Okay, last bit. Last bit is a little bit, um, this may not be super obvious. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The normalization. Okay. Now, normally the normalization is square root of, this was on your test, square root of 2 over L. When we did one dimensional particle in a box, we did the normalization several times and it was on your test. It was the square root of 2 over the length. Okay, now what you do, by the way, is you just multiply the normalization constant. So square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2, and then I've got the square root of L, except that I've got two of them. So square root of 2, sorry, 2 over the square root of Lx divided by the square root of Ly. Okay, so that's, that, that's literally it. Now, as before, we can also figure out the uh, energy. What you do is you would plug these into... Um, now that we have the solution, we can learn other things. And one of those other things is the energy. Here, I'll put that up here. Okay, and the solution is, it gets a little complicated, but I'll decomplicate it here in a second. 
it, it's, a, it's a bit of a handful, right? As I, as I mentioned, as you get into more dimensions, things will get a little bit more complicated. And h squared over eta. Okay, and there's a, those two pi's are eaten up because I, I changed h bar to h. So anyway, just to point that out. Now, of course, n sub x, n sub y can be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, on and on and on. And they don't have to match. If n sub x is 1, n sub y could be 1, 2, or 3, could be anything. Again, that's the concept of there being no crosstalk. So why would the quantum number in n be influencing the quantum number in y? Now there's another bit to that, which is that notice that we now have two quantum numbers. As we go up a dimension, you gain a quantum number. Now that's also going to happen when we get to three dimensions. If we had three dimensions, we, had, we would have an n sub z. Who cares? This is all like kind of like kid stuff. When we get to rotational quantum mechanics, Guess what? We're gonna we're gonna build up more quantum numbers. So you're gonna have to get used to. You're gonna have three quantum numbers when we do three dimensional rotation, like spherical coordinates. So get used to the fact that you have more than one quantum number. Now, before you think like, well, I've never heard of that before. Yes, you have. Remember, um, you have hydrogen, one s orbital. Right? That's there's a one and there's an s. Those are two quantum numbers. In contrast to a two s orbital. There's a different quantum number, two, but the s is the same. So those are two different quantum numbers, except one of them is the same, which is the L quantum number for, for s, for an s state. Then you can have a 2p state. Okay, so now I've got, uh, I can see my two quantum numbers, the number two, the letter p, those are two quantum numbers. But you know that there's actually a px and a py and a pz. So now we have three quantum numbers. I'm just previewing, don't even write that down. We're going to be there in about two weeks. In two weeks, we're covering the hydrogen atom, and it will have three quantum numbers. And but, so anyway, I just said something about that. OK, last bit, and then we'll look at some wave functions, is um, here. Let me actually, let me go ahead and move the board up. And maybe I'm drawing a wave function right now. This is the, I don't know what I'm going to do, because I have to do it after the fact. God, this is so weird. Anyway, let's do a degeneracy. To make it a little, I said it'd be a little bit easier. Let's say if Lx is equal to Ly, it's easier to render this on a computer, and let's just call that L, uh, then what you would have is the energy for a wave function is now just an x squared plus an y squared. h squared over an L squared. Okay, so what you see here is, I, I hope this is kind of obvious, right? So this is the n sub x is equal to the n sub y, that's 1. I don't know why my x is here. x is are really small today, anyway. n sub x, n sub y is what you see right here. So you can remember I was saying before, it kind of looks like what you would imagine, like a drum vibration, a, a square drum. I've never seen a square drum, but anyway. So that's what like, like a low frequency vibration would look like on a square drum. So hopefully that's kind of easy to visualize. Now, let me throw another one at you. Let's do nx is equal to 1, and y is equal to 2. And so I'm drawing that right now. And the energy would be 5h squared, each bar squared. Uh, what was that? H, h bar or h? No, that's just h. Sorry, I better check that. My notes may be messed up. I'll just fix it digitally. I've got to remember to do that now. OK, so you're seeing that as well. Then you notice how it kind of looks like a p-state, like if a p-state, a p-state, a hydrogen p-state, if you just squashed it, kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Now, here's my point, not just to draw these kind of neat looking images. I hope you like them. Uh, but to point this out, an x of 2 and y of 1, the energy would still be 4 plus 1, 5 h squared over 8 and l squared. You can see that here. It's just turned around, right? So it's like one's like a px, the other's like a py, and they have the same energy, which hopefully you, you recall this. You should have seen this before. This is a, a degeneracy. 
Okay, so when we get into multiple dimensions, not only do you get multiple quantum numbers, but depending on how the energies work, you could get into degeneracies. Now, recall that I just talked about two p orbitals, px, py, and pz. And maybe you recall that until you're worried about them bonding with something like, like you've had inorganic, right? Maybe you took inorganic. You would learn a lot about that stuff in inorganic. You should have seen some of organic. Until the p orbitals are interacting with another atom's p orbitals, they're degenerate, right? px and py and pz all have the same energy. And you're, you're basically, you're starting to see that behavior here. And this is, again, these are not atomic wave functions. We're getting there. We'll be there in two weeks. But they, sure, they certainly are similar. So uh, with that bit, I want to just show one other thing, which is what happens when you have nx of 2 and then y of 2. So these are kind of neat. So you know, I can like just obviously I draw these at home on my computer and then I, I make them nice so that you can see them in here. Uh, sometimes I just mess around and make things up just to see what they look like. So uh, it's kind of cool, right? So that's, that's nx2 and y2. And notice that it's also non-degenerate. So the ground state's non-degenerate. The first excited state where we have one of the quantum numbers is a two is degenerate. But then when I have nx of two and y of two, notice that that is actually no longer degenerate. There's only one state. You can tell that the, you can you can identify degeneracies in experiments based on certain behaviors, like when you're doing spectroscopy. That's how we know that these degeneracies are real and they exist. Okay, last bit. Um, I'm guessing I'm showing that right here. Let me show you what happens when, I have to do this on a computer, what happens when we do X, Y, Z. And again, I have to do this on my computer, so, so you're seeing that right here. And I've lined these up from uh, the ground state, which is kind of like, like a 1S looking thing. All right, so what I'm doing is a three-dimensional particle in a box. And what you're seeing here is the lowest energy state, so it looks like a 1S state of hydrogen, except it's kind of box-like. But again, I'm not doing hydrogen, I'm doing a particle in a three-dimensional box. And that has a certain energy. And then what I've plotted here is the next excited state where I have a quantum number of two for either x, y, or z. And so now you can see like orbitals that kind of look like px and py and pz, except again, they're, they're like slightly cubic. Now the way I do that, by the way, is I tell the computer, I, I create the wave functions, which look just like that up there, except that there is a sine of z. I put that in the computer. And then I tell the computer, hey, draw a continuous surface when you see the wave function is equal to about 1.0. That's the idea. And then I tell it, like, oh, but in case it's actually not 1.0, you know, plus 1.0, but minus 1.0, do the same thing but make it a red color. So that's called an isosurface. That is how you render three-dimensional wave functions. Now, you, there are such things as four-dimensional wave functions which cannot be rendered by anything. That's kind of cool too, but anyway, that's theoretical physics. Even, even physical chemistry and grad school don't cover that kind of stuff. Uh, all right, well, with that, um, we're going to take a little bit of a break and introduce two dimensional. Two dimensional, um, we're going to do the same thing, except now we're going to use rotational wave function. So give me a minute to wipe out the board, and then we're going to start on that subject, and that'll be enough for today, and we'll get into more detail in the next class. All right, everyone, welcome back. So I've got about 10 minutes, so kind of like last lecture, I'm going to just introduce some, uh, some concepts, and we'll get into more detail next time. So now that we're doing like two-dimensional this and that, and you know, as I've said many times, that all the types of problems that we do just one after the other, they all have names. This is the particle on a string. So imagine tying a cat to a string, and then uh, imagine that you tie like a baseball to a string and then you sling it around and around and around, right? So that's what we're doing. So it's like a freeway because it's a particle that can just keep moving, moving, moving. There's no, there won't be any potential energy. So we're kind of like going back to like free waves again. And its length is fixed. There, there's like, there's like a, an axle and, um, it, it, and the string is fixed and we're just spinning, 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 right? So the quantum mechanics of something spinning in a plane Right? So we're going to be doing cylindrical coordinates. Uh, we don't need to do spherical coordinates, which is fully three-dimensional. We don't need to do that yet. Right? So that'll be two classes from now. Okay, now what I'm going to do for today is I'm going to figure out the wave functions by being clever. And then next class, I'm going to figure out the wave functions via the hideous mathematics. So 
Okay, but the clever way is always appreciated, right? Now, I've got some cool visuals, and so drop it if you have it. And here's what's, what I'm doing is that right, right here you see that I am creating a particle in the box weight function. Now, remember that uh, I'm doing something, you know, particle in the box is uh, kind of like free waves, except that there's, there's a beginning and an end to this. And, and this whole particle and a string thing, what you're going to see is that basically it's like taking parts of the free wave and taking parts of the particle in the box and putting them together. Now, when it comes to solving the wave functions, this is the part of the particle in the string that is similar to the particle in a 1D box. So a particle in a 2D string has similarities to the particle in a 1D box. So notice I've drawn the particle in the 1D box wave functions, and I'm doing this kind of more for myself, right? Now what I'm doing is I am taking this and I'm folding it over on itself. Now, because I have two reasons, now, now, now you see what I'm doing. Now we live in two dimensions, right? I can't fold a flat piece of paper, which is one dimensional, into itself without being in two dimensions. So now I'm in two dimensions, right? And, uh, and, and it's circular, right? Particle on a string. So like, like the, the plane of the paper, now that it's folded over on itself, is like the track that the particle swings around in, right? And of course, it has a wave function. Now those wave functions are truly represented by those particle in the boxes that are folded over on themselves. Okay, so, now, again, I hope that this is a nice visual. I spent a long time making this. This took me like almost an entire day to draw this, by the way. It's really, it's actually like accurate in terms of like how the lines are lined up. It's not like I just kind of like imagined what it should look like and then drew it. I actually did this mathematically, which got it so hard. Anyway, um, but I mean, it's like it looks way better, right? And better than anything I could have ever drawn. Okay, what are we going to do with this thing? All right, now, let's see. We're trying to figure out wave functions. A good starting point would be, what's the De Broglie wave, wave functions? What's the wave length? I mean, I can't imagine a better starting point. Okay, so let's look at the bottom deal. Now, the bottom guy, actually, that's not a part, that's a straight line, right? That's not a normal particle in the box wave function. So I've, I've, I've um, cheated a little bit. Now let me point out that that thing, I'm trying not to overlap whatever is there. The wavelength of a flat line is, uh, is in, sorry, that's infinity. Infinity. I had to think about it. Okay. All right, so of course, a straight line, you have the wavelength's infinity. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, now let me, let me represent this as a function of the length of the box before it was folded over itself. And I'm going to divide that by some kind of quantum number, which is zero. Now, in terms of what you see here, in terms of the flat line, I'm going to give it a pass. Notice that there's a little check mark by it, right? I'm giving that guy a pass because it is smooth and continuous, right? So that's, that makes it valid. OK, let's look at the next one. The next one has a wavelength of, I mean, from, from the particle in the box, its wavelength was 2L. And um, so let's call that 2L over 1. So a quantum number of 1. And problem is that no. As you can see in the graphic, it is not smooth and continuous because there's a sharp point. Right? There's a sharp point on it. That may be continuous, but it's not smooth. OK, now let's look at the next one. Wavelength of, uh, let's see. Now that is a wavelength of L. So guess what? I'm going to call that 2L over 2. Now, can you see the pattern that I'm developing? 2L over 0, 1, 2, on and on, next one's 3, next one's 4, on and on and on, right? You get it? And guess what? That's the pass. If I go to 2L over 3, it's a fail. 2L over 4, it's a pass. Okay. So notice that what I've done here is I've created a, you know, a nice picture, and I figured out a little bit of a pattern, not a little bit, I figured out a pattern here to know what the wavelengths are and which ones are smooth and continuous, which ones are allowed. Okay, now what that means is, is that I have a trend, and the trend is that the wavelength is L over M. Notice I got rid of the two. Why did I get rid of the two? Because only every other one works, right? So that's why the two got eaten up. So I've got two uh, L over M, where M is 0, 1, 
two, three, dot, dot, dot. See, again, that's a one, two, three is because I got rid of the two, two belt. That, that's why that works. Now, notice that M is a new quantum number, right? It's telling us one state from the other. And as you can see, obviously, this is a low energy state because it has no nodes. And as we go up, we have more nodes. Those are higher, higher energy states. I hope that's obvious. Okay, notice that we've got a new quantum number, and that kind of, <laughs> that kind of sucks. Okay, last bit. Last bit is uh, what I can do here is I want to turn, I want to think about how to turn the particle in the box into more of a spherical thing. So to do that, I want to point out that that the length can be uh, the length of the box before the, the sheet before I folded it over. Uh, when it's folded over, I can relate it to the radius by two pi r. And that's the circumference of a sphere. So two pi r is the length of the box. Now, what I like about that is now I'm using spherical and uh, sorry cylindrical type variables r, and c, and all that. Okay. Now I also know that okay. So then lambda is two pi r over m. So now I'm getting closer to that to I wait. Now since the momentum is h over lambda, right, that's the Broglie's equation, it's h over lambda, then what I've got, and I've got a formula for lambda, momentum is m, uh, uh, what am I doing? Um, oh, mh over 2 pi r, which of course is equal to mh bar over, uh, over r. Uh, here, let me, let me wipe this out. Okay. <laughs> it's really awkward doing that. Anyway, so I ate the 2 pi. I ate up the 2 pi by absorbing it into Planck's constant to give me h bar. Remember I told you that 2 pi keeps showing up, and that's why we have h bar. It's really annoying. Okay, the last bit. The last bit here is now that I'll keep working down here. Um, energy. is always momentum squared over the mass. Momentum squared over 2 times the mass. Notice that I've got a bit of a problem that now I have two different m's. I've got an m quantum number and I've got an m for mass. From now on, I will have to write out mass. I have to write out the words so that you don't get confused. Anyway, I'll, I'll emphasize that as it comes up. It will come up a bunch. Okay, now what is this? This is uh, m, our quantum number, h bar squared over 2 times mass times r squared. Okay, last bit that you may recall from physics when you learned about rotation, rotational energy. This is called I. That is the moment, remember this, of inertia. Right, so that's why it's the letter I, it's inertia. So R here, R in our in our, our particle on the sphere, right? The R is fixed, so I just want to point that out. Okay. So this is M squared H bar squared over 2i. Okay, so notice that I've used wave mechanics. I've basically figured out the wave functions, more on that next lecture, and I've even figured out the energies. I haven't even I haven't even used the Schrodinger equation. Now again, this is just an example of being clever and figuring things out. Next lecture, we're going to do the Schrodinger equation. One last thing. One last thing. I got to point this out. M. Let me, let me just go back here. Sorry, I, I know I'm out of time, right? Notice I left a little space here. M is zero, one, two, three. Well, the energy is m squared, and that means that technically I could have minus 1, or minus 2, or minus 3. So that would be allowed, right, because the energy is m squared, so the minuses don't matter. Now, that sounds like some clever math trickery, but it actually means something. It, it has to mean something. Okay, so let's say that that's positive energy, positive m, then that's a negative m. Right, so you can you can rotate more than one way. That's a degeneracy as well, right? There's another one of our degeneracies coming up. If m is minus one, you get this energy. If it's plus one, you get the same energy. So a degeneracy.
All right, anyway, I think I went over time, so that is that. Warning, next lecture, we're going to get into angles and sines and cosines. And unfortunately, there's even an ATAN. Sorry about that. I'll see you then.